everyone and welcome to Sky Scholar. In the last video, we discussed the axis of evil and the alignment of low multiples with the ecliptic plane. We highlighted once again that the alignment of low order multiples with the ecliptic plane demonstrates a violation of the Copernican principle, a sure manifestation of the unscientific nature of the CMB maps. In this video, we complete our look at the CMB map anomalies. We cannot cover them all, as this would never end. But after today, everyone that examines my video playlist on the CMB will have a fairly good understanding of the problems involved. Today, we begin by reviewing the work of the Russian cosmologist Professor Oleg Verkhodanov. He asserted that the low multiple anomalies were related to local sources or systematics. As a result, the CMB anisotropy maps have nothing to do with cosmology. He stated the following. There are some hints demonstrating that the problem of existence of axis of evil can be connected with the instability of CMB reconstruction at low multiples, L between 2 and 10, in the ILC method. In these two papers, Verkhodanov compared the multiples produced by the WMAP and Planck satellites. Here are examples of what he observed first for multiples L equal 5 and L equal 7. He noticed that the L equal 5 difference map is sensitive to the equatorial coordinate system, which is overlaid on the map. Notice how the equatorial poles are placed. For the difference map at L equal 7, the ecliptic coordinate grid is overlaid and the saddle points are at the ecliptic poles. He then examined the sum of L equal 41 to 46 multiples and the differences for WMAP and Planck. Note that there is substantial residual power in the differences. He then stated the following. All maps of multiple differences with high amplitude contain features tied to galactic, ecliptic, and or equatorial terrestrial coordinate systems. That should give everyone pause relative to the validity of the CMB images. He further emphasized that differences between WMAP and Planck power spectra were related to differences in map preparation. Finally, he noted the following. The equatorial system features detected in some CMB correlation maps or in the single harmonics maps can be due to the influence of the Earth microwave emission. Also, through the antenna backlobes are possible solar wind emissions modulated by the Earth's magnetosphere where the magnetic axis is close to the Earth rotation axis. As such, the Earth might well be interfering with the measurements even at L2. The problem for cosmology is that if all the anomalies in the low L data can be linked to local sources such as the ecliptic and the Earth, this implies that all the low L data has nothing to do with cosmology and, as a result, the entire maps have nothing to do with cosmology. We already saw that this was the case with the dipole. The quadrupole value is too low, the alignments are suspect, and the list goes on. Along these lines, it is interesting to note that the WMAP team actually wrote a paper comparing their findings with those of the Planck satellite. In this paper, they observed that the WMAP and Planck data are different for L values greater than 100 at the 2.5% level, depending on how uncertainties are handled. But most importantly, they assert that while cosmological parameters obtained by the two teams agree on a parameter-by-parameter -parameter comparison, the values are vastly different when considered as a set. They write, We find that while individual parameter values agree within uncertainties, the six parameters taken together are discrepant at the six sigma level. This cannot occur if the results actually had true cosmological significance. The WMAP team concludes, the disagreement between the Planck and WMAP data could signal a failure of the six-parameter lambda CDM model and hence point to evidence of new physics. Of course, they always want new physics, rather than admit that something is not right with the entire field of cosmology and that their anisotropy maps have no scientific value. The following year, the WMAP team again addressed the lack of agreement with the Planck results. We conclude that the parameters from the Planck high multiple spectrum probably differ from the underlying values due to either an unlikely statistical fluctuation or unaccounted for systematics persisting in the Planck data. So even within the restricted confines of their pseudo-spherical harmonic analysis, Problems remain despite the fact that the Planck and WMAP teams have moved mountains in order to get the anisotropy maps to at least seem to match on a coarse level. After all, they both had to invoke similar methods to remove the galactic foreground. 
Besides the alignment of multiples, the next anomaly to consider is the cold spot in the anisotropy map, first highlighted in this paper and then discussed in numerous others. This is the position of the cold spot on the WMAP CMB anisotropy image. Recently, the cold spot has received renewed attention due to the publication of this paper, which highlighted that it could be associated with a supervoid in the cosmic web. This is exactly opposed to this paper, published in 2017, which stated that the cold spot could not be accounted for by such voids. The question which remains is whether or not this spot is real or just the product of data processing or galactic contamination within the CMB map. Now, in this table, Kovacs et al. contend that the cold spot could not be attributed to the galactic foreground because there is no frequency dependence in the Planck channel maps. With that in mind, let us have a look at the Planck maps for each channel in this region. At low frequency, note that much of the galaxy has already been processed away, as we saw when comparing cleaned and unclean maps from the WMAP satellite. In this figure, the lowest frequencies for the WMAP satellite are not even shown, because the images would be nearly entirely red. In reality, the lowest frequency maps of the Planck satellite are polluted by remnants from attempting to minimize the effects of the galaxy throughout the data set. Despite this fact, let us examine the Planck images. At the lowest frequencies, it does seem that the cold spot is present as a regular feature. Now examine the image at 857 GHz. In the region immediately adjacent to the cold spot, there is a strong galactic signal. As such, a suspension of disbelief is required if one is to advance that the cold spot cannot be caused by the processing of galactic signals. Next, just to give everyone an idea of how cosmological parameters have changed, in 1997, Charles Lineweaver wrote this paper. For the most famous parameter, the Hubble constant, he gave a value of 30 plus 13 minus 9. Compare that with the accepted value from the Planck 2018 data release, namely 67.66 plus or minus 0.42. The two values are not even close to each other when the error bars are considered. So when you see cosmological parameters, keep in mind all the assumptions that are behind these numbers. Spherical harmonic analysis is a mathematical approach which is no more relevant to the universe than any other. Those who argue otherwise do so because they have no other means of justifying their claims. Now some have argued that the anisotropy maps demonstrate that the microwave background cannot have a local origin due to phenomena such as the integrated sachs wolf effect or the sanyev zeldovich effect observed in the anisotropy maps. The integrated sachs wolf effect is manifested as a gravitational redshift in CMB data. It is said to occur at scales larger than 10 degrees in the CMB map. That is, in the low L region as seen here. The problem is that the low L terms bring up significant questions as to whether or not the CMB maps have anything to do at all with cosmology. That was the point of the alignment analysis and of Professor Verkhodanov when he emphasized that all multiple anomalies at low L could be understood in the framework of local sources of microwave emission. The truth is that there are serious problems in the region of the sachs wolf Plateau and therefore all results dependent on low L multiples must be discounted including the integrated sachs wolf effect. As for the SZ effect, it is said to cause a change in the brightness temperature of the background due to distant galaxy clusters. Unlike the sachs wolf effect, which occurs at low L values, one must search for the SZ effect at high L values because this effect occurs at small scales. The SZ effect is a manifestation of inverse Compton scattering, whereby an electron is scattering off a photon to which it transfers energy. The SZ effect is small changing the brightness of the black body by 0.1% at most. There are actually two types of SZ effect. First, there is a thermal SZ effect where the change occurs due to interaction with electrons at high temperatures. Second, there is also a kinetic SZ effect where the interaction is with electrons that have an elevated bulk motion. The important aspect of the SZ effect is that it is independent of redshifts. As a result, the SZ effect is not dependent on the distance to the galaxy which is causing the change. If one considers the blackbody spectrum, then the SZ effect causes a distortion in the spectrum associated with crossing a given galaxy because the photon has interacted with cluster material. As a result, the blackbody spectrum gets distorted such that the high frequencies increase in intensity and the lower frequencies decrease. 
This curve highlights where the changes occur in intensity as a function of frequency. One can see that the lowest frequencies experience the greatest decrease in intensity, while the frequencies near 200 gigahertz remain nearly unchanged. Brightness temperature above 200 gigahertz should experience an increase in signal. The initial Planck list of potential galaxy clusters included over a thousand locations in the CMB map. That was eventually brought down to several hundred cluster candidates, as one can see here. Confirmation of a potential SZ cluster was made by several methods, including X-ray and optical imaging. X-ray emissions are used to support the discovery of SZ clusters because they are indicative of elevated temperatures needed for the inverse Compton scattering. So now, let us examine what an SZ cluster is supposed to look like at the Planck frequencies. Here's a textbook example from the Planck website. One sees that at the lowest frequencies, the region of the cluster is blue, indicative of low signal intensity. Then it is green at 217 GHz, indicating a null point exactly as expected. Then it is red at the higher frequencies. That sure looks impressive, doesn't it? Wow, SZ effects sure look real. But wait, these images are all for cleaned frequency maps. Notice that the Planck team is not providing the raw frequency maps in this case. Yet in this paper, the Planck team does provide both the raw frequency maps and the clean frequency maps for a total of 12 clusters. We will examine five of them a little closer. We start with this cluster. Now just examine the lowest two frequencies for the raw and then the cleaned images. Do you see the red in the raw image and how a blue spot exists in its place in the processed image? How can this happen? The meaning of the data has been completely changed by processing. But look at the resulting cluster image. It is fantastic with a signal to noise of nearly 30 to 1 according to the Planck team. But it is also a myth given the raw data. The signal to noise is meaningless because the cleaned images do not accurately portray the information in the raw images. Now in producing their final cluster images from the combination of frequency images, the Planck team often allows the linear combination coefficients to change from cluster to cluster. Talk about introducing complete data manipulation in science. Next look at this cluster. Again, for the lowest two frequencies, the red spot is completely removed by cleaning. How can this be? But nonetheless, here's the resultant cluster. Next, have a look at this cluster. In the raw images, the lowest channels have strong red regions, but they are completely gone in the cleaned images. Is this for real? Has reason completely left cosmology? Now have a look at this cluster. At the lowest frequencies, the red intensity seen in the raw images is completely removed from the clean image. Now at the highest frequency, the unwanted blue region is now miraculously replaced with the desired red and green. Next, have a look at the two highest frequencies for another cluster. Now the Planck team at the highest frequencies has created the needed red spots in the cleaned images when the region was solid blue prior to cleaning. At the two lowest frequencies, the red regions have now been replaced by green. This is just embarrassing. We can go on and on about the problems in their SZ data processing, but the point has been made. In fact, there can be no better demonstration that the CMB maps have nothing to do with science than by simply examining how the Planck team analyzed their SZ findings. For nearly 20 years now, I have mentioned that it is impossible to remove the galaxy through cleaning, and this proves the point. The entire episode is tragic and completely outside the bounds of reason in imaging science. When an image is clean, one does not get to reverse its scientific meaning. Recall also that at high L values, the WMAP data differs from the Planck data at the 2.5% level. So if the Planck data still has problems with systematic errors, they have no place in making claims about the statistical significance of their SZ data, especially when the effect sought is so small. The fact remains that our own galaxy is present, and one can never properly account for its contribution or clean the resultant image. At low frequencies, we already saw that the unclean CMB maps are flooded with signal from the galaxy. At each frequency, that signal must be removed, and the manner in which the cleaning is conducted is different for each frequency, and now even for each cluster. As such, when the cosmologists are cleaning their data, they are introducing systematic errors which make the resulting SZ measurements highly significant. In addition, discrete point sources can exist in the sky which have nothing to do with the SZ effect. Remember that the Planck analysis now contains thousands of point sources and there are likely to be many others as we saw in this video.
There is also the problem of inherently low signal to noise in the Planck and WMAP yearly data sets as we saw here. For cluster analysis, the Planck team claims to have signal to noise which is as high as 29 to 1 or better. But that is a myth brought on by distortions through data processing, including the filters they apply. It is also interesting to consider the monopole spectrum measured by the COBE satellite. You recall that the FIRAS spectrum is the most perfect blackbody spectrum ever measured by humanity. The error bars are so small that they have to be expanded 400 fold just to be seen on the plot. Now consider this perfection in light of our own galaxy whose presence is found at each frequency. How is it possible that distant galaxy clusters can produce easily measured SZ effects but our own galaxy and the local group is unable to distort the monopole as observed by FIRAS? In any event, if high energy electrons are distorting the spectrum in distant galaxies, then similar electrons must be distorting the spectrum when we observe from Earth. Just have a look at this X-ray image from the E-Rosita mission released a couple of years ago and note the enormous bubble-like signals both above and below the galaxy. High energy electrons are just as likely to exist both within and near our own galaxy which can produce a global as the effect. But if that is true, why is the monopole spectrum as viewed from our planet so perfect? The SZ effect might be small but it is not reasonable to claim its detection in distant galaxy clusters with no clear detection in our own galaxy. In any case, keep the X-ray images of the sky in mind when cosmologists try to claim that they can remove signal from the galaxy at lower frequencies and create the CMB and isotropy maps from which they extract the SC effect. Again, it is impossible to properly remove the effect of the galaxy from the CMB data because we do not have perfect knowledge of the level of its contribution. In the end, the SZ effect is said to provide evidence that the monopole of the CMB permeates the universe. But if cosmology wants to truly establish the CMB, let them measure the monopole at L2 and stop ignoring the fact that the Planck satellite HFI was never able to do so. Finally, beyond the SZ effect, remember that the CMB maps are likely to have little or no scientific value. In this respect, Cover has published a paper wherein he demonstrates that sky maps with no anisotropies are a better fit to the WMAP time order data than those from the official WMAP team analysis. That paper cites my own work both on the COBE and WMAP satellites. Well that concludes our analysis of the satellite data. I hope that this series has given everyone a sense that things are not quite as clear cut in cosmology as currently portrayed. There are many issues related to how the anisotropy maps are generated, the combination of frequency data, the third law violation, the inability to properly remove the foreground, the extremely low signal to noise, and the yearly variabilities observed. But most of all is the fact that the monopole has never been measured at L2. As such, in the next video we will turn our attention towards spectroscopy and water. Cosmologists have been too close to dismiss the possibility that the ferrous monopole signal originates from our own planet and they have yet to prove otherwise. That is all for now. If you enjoyed the video today, promote the channel. Mention the work to your friends and to your local astronomy club. Support me with a like and subscribe for more videos as we look more closely at the sun, the stars and beyond. Comments are always welcome down below and I'll see you soon on our next video.